Good morning. I am Lance French, Business Development Manager for Braun Intertech, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Wading Through the Swamp, Wetlands, Endangered Species, and Environmental Assessments. Our experts for today are our own bronze, Daniel DeJody and Brady Turk. Thank you guys for joining us today. Hey, Lance. Thanks for having us, man. Hi, Lance. Happy to be here. Thanks. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, if you have any questions, please send them through the uh, questions tab on your GoToWebinar window. If we don't get to your questions, I will make sure that they see them and we'll get an answer to you as soon as possible. We are recording this webinar and it will be available to rewatch on our website soon along with the slides and we will send you an email with the link when they're made available probably tomorrow just to let you know to just to let you guys know so so let's get to it so i'm going to introduce our experts today daniel de jody uh phd in plant ecology so daniel can i do i need to call you doctor or is, is dan okay daniel or daniel's fine you don't need to call me doctor my <laughs> wife likes to remind me on i'm not the type of doctor that helps people at least that's what she says but that's awesome uh, I she, she's, she's, she's never needed to get a Corps of Engineers wetland permit, so if she did, she'd find out how I can help people. I think it'd be funny for you to go out in the field and with your little stethoscope and put your put your stethoscope to a plant or something. That would be awesome. So, but yes, 21 years of environmental consulting experience um, and areas to focus at Braun Intertech are uh, natural resources, wetlands, and danger species and environmental review. And um, you're not currently uh, in Minnesota, but you're, but you're based out of uh, Minneapolis, is it? That's correct. Women? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a one of the few, uh, few times where you can't get any further apart in our company than um, than our two experts. Daniel's in Minnesota, and then uh, Brady is actually down in Southern Louisiana. Uh, Brady Turk is uh, he has a, a BS in wildlife fisheries management. He has 22 years of environmental consulting. And he also has natural resources, uh, wetlands delineation permitting, and also phase one. So, welcome, guys. I'm glad uh, I'm glad you were able to make it. And um, so, I wanted to start off with uh, why we're here: the swamp of natural resources. So, Dr. DeJudy, DeJody, take it away. Yes. Yeah, so we we had to we were trying to come up with a creative name. And so with this for this webinar and wading through the swamp is a has literal and figurative meanings. A lot of times if you're not familiar with uh, a lot of environmental regulations, they can seem like a swamp to get through. If you're a, somebody that wants to build a, a solar farm or a wind farm, renewable energy farm, there's there's wetlands in the way. You've got to figure out how to navigate through that swamp and that's where we can help you. So we're going to talk about wetlands today. Waters of the U.S. permitting and threatened and endangered species and environmental review, and that covers things like environmental assessments and environmental impact statements. Awesome. So this is the great. So wetland can be a lot of different things, and and I, I'm sure there's some confusion. What? So I'm glad you put the slide in. So what are what exactly is a wetland here? We're talking about. So I'll I'll go from that. Uh... Lance, I mean, you know, a lot of there's probably a lot of different interpretations of what it is, and I'm sure a lot of the the folks that are joining us have seen, you know, different um, definitions, whatever. But EPA is the promulgated agency that you know covers the uh, has jurisdiction over wetlands. But um, you know, as the slide says, wetlands are those areas that are inundated or saturated by surface and groundwater um, at you know some frequencies and durations during the year under normal circumstances. Um, and, and because of that saturation and whatnot in hydrology, you have a prevalence of, uh, you know, your wetland vegetation typically adapted for life in saturated soil conditions. And, um, you know, in general, you know, anything that's a swamp, marsh, bog, uh, and similar areas are considered wetland. But that is the uh, definition that is put out by EPA that we follow. Is there a certain like land mass that has to be at least a certain size before it could be classified as a wetland? Or, I mean, I'd say I have a property and every time it rains, you know, and, you know, it washes, you know, washes in, the, it, there's a spot in my yard that's always wet. I mean, does that, Ooh. is there different stipulations or? There's really not anything as far as the size goes. I mean, the, the whole idea behind the, the, Clean Water Act and, and the wetland regulations is there's, you know, the whole focus is, is no net loss of, of wetlands. So, 
with that idea being put out there, you know, that every effort is taken to protect those areas, no matter how small or how large they are in a, in a nutshell. Okay. Okay. So the types of wetlands we have, so you guys being so far apart, uh, uh, Daniel, you're up north, and, and Brady, you're down south. So, are, are you seeing are wetlands being treated the same, or how does that work? Like, I'll let I'll let Daniel go on that. On what what do you see up north? And I can I can take it down here. Okay. Well, the as Brady mentioned, there's a wetland definition through the EAPA, and then actual on the ground jurisdiction for regulations is through the Corps of Engineers for purposes of dredge and fill permitting. And so you've got, you know, different types of wetlands are treated, you know, at a large scale similar across the country because there's the Corps of Engineers as a federal agency that's gonna have similar guidelines throughout the country. And then they delegate to smaller districts and regions for, for um, jurisdiction or, or for implementation of regulations. And then there are state regulations too, in many cases for, for instance, in Minnesota, we have a state wetland law that has a little bit slightly different regulations that re regulates how you can impact wetlands or not impact wetlands or have to mitigate for them. And the, the way you define a wetland or delineate a wetland is the same under the, uh, in this case, under the state law and under the federal law but then the way they regulate is a little bit different. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. And down here in Louisiana, um, tying back in on the on the state um, state level, uh, we have a Department of Natural Resources um, that has jurisdiction over what's called the coast. No, excuse me, the coastal zone down here, and it's generally everything south of Interstate 10 down here. So um, whenever there's any kind of disturbance or impacts to jurisdictional wetlands south of that boundary, the Department of Natural Resources in coordination with the Corps of Engineers both take, um, you know, a liking to, to the project. So we do a, a joint permit application for that. So that's, that's generally in the sense of what's happening down here. So, but as Dan, you mentioned, everything across the country is, is treated the same as just, uh, you know, kind of regional perspective and, and, you know, what you're doing there. So, so here's a, here's probably a silly question, but I know New Orleans is below sea level. So would, would New Orleans be considered like the whole city be considered a wetland or not necessarily, or? Probably depend on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, you know, and, and to answer your question, no, I mean, and, and we'll get into some more slides later on in the presentation on, on, you know, what, uh, you know, the three characteristics that you have to have to make it a wetland. But, um, you know, generally in New Orleans, everything uh, that goes on there, I mean, even in New Orleans and, uh, they have their own uh, municipal regulations for wetlands, which is kind of odd, but you know, everything down there is just, it's just so soupy and, and stuff. So, I mean, there's a whole lot of um, regulations going into that. So if, um, if I, if I can, I try to stay out of New Orleans as much as I can. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so wetland characteristics. So what, so what are we looking at? So I'll go on that again. Um, and for, for all our, audience out there, um, it, it's, it's good to know that you have to have all three of these wetland char characteristics for an area to be considered a wetland. So, I mean, if you have, if you don't have wetland vegetation and you have the other two characteristics, then, you know, it rules it out. So um, for it to be a jurisdictional wetland, you have to have your wetland vegetation, of course, is self-explanatory. I mean, these, um, these plants grow in water or is adapted to growing in soil that is periodically flooded water and especially down here you can see you know the cypress trees and whatnot uh, cattails and stuff like that so I mean it's a clear clear indication some some vegetation is not so easy but in doing it so many years as I have and Daniel has it's you know it's easier to locate those kind of uh, areas um, another thing that we look at is well in hydrology um, this gets a little more technical but uh, basically it's the way that water moves both on top of and through the soil. So, I mean, if you, and I mean, that's classic with your wetlands and especially in depressional areas. I mean, you see ponding water um, and then, you know, that kind of goes into the type of soils that you have, um, you know, your hydric wet soils kind of tie into the other two characteristics where, you know, those soils are sufficiently wet in the upper horizon during anaerobic conditions during the growing season and anaerobic conditions as everybody knows is a lack of oxygen so 
you know, you have to have all three of those come together as one, um, one impact to have an error to be a wetland. So if, if you have one of those that you can cross out, then that area is obviously not a wetland. Does it matter so that, if it's natural or if it's man-made? Um, we'll get into that a little bit later okay. in the presentation, but generally, okay. in a general sense, um, most man-made um, impoundments, ponds, depressions, that type, usually are not jurisdictional. Now, this, this slide kind of gets back to a couple of things you asked earlier, Lance, about the wet spot in your yard or about yeah. New Orleans. Well, in New Orleans, you know, behind the dikes, they're pumping a lot. So, it, you know, if it was left alone, natural and undeveloped, it probably would all be wetland. But if they're pumping it, they're affecting the hydrology. So if you ask Brady and I, say, to come to your yard and tell you if that spot's a wetland, we're going to be looking for these three parameters and we're going to look for hydric soil. And so it's, it's a, a common thing that I have... You get comments back from landowners. They'll tell me, well, that spot just holds some water when it rains. It's not a wetland. And I say, well, you know, we got a procedures to do that. We'll look for like for the hydric soil. And a wetland is defined as something that's saturated in during the growing season for at least five to 12 and a half percent of the growing season. So a wetland might be dry most of the season. And so you might not think it's a wetland. But so we would, Brady and I would look at the soils to look for these indicators of the colors. And this picture of the soil profile here shows, you know, like a gray background and then this rusty coloring. And so this would be an indication of a wetland soil where you've got a fluctuating water table and you've got depletion, reduction during anaerobic conditions. You have oxidation when it's not saturated. So we look for things like that to kind of tell us if it's a wetland or not. So it's not always obvious if something's a wetland or not because it might be dry a lot of the time. And if it's hey, dry, I'm oh, sorry, if it was dry, how can it have vegetation though? Or is, are we talking about grass or just anything? Well, we would look at the indiv individual species. We would identify what are the species of grass, for instance, that grow there. And there's the, the Corps of Engineers and before them, the Fish and Wildlife Service would classify individual species on their fidelity to wetlands. So it might be something that a plant, that, the species that 100% of the time grows in a wetlands or 100% grows in a non-wetland or, or maybe it's 50-50. And so we, we you know, look at the, which are the dominant plants there and then how they are ranked as to their affinity for wetlands. Right, gotcha. Brady, you were gonna say something. Yeah, I was just gonna ask Daniel, Daniel, what is your growing season up north? I know ours here is probably about 280 to 290 days. I don't know the, um, I don't know the number off the top of my head. I believe to get to the 5% range, we're probably about two or three weeks of saturation that are needed in the north to um, satisfy the minimum amount of saturation for a wetland. Gotcha. Brady, do you want to talk about the new rule that was came out last summer? Yeah. Um, so last summer, um, from the you know, from the Trump administration, he put forth some some new uh, regulations on waters of the U.S. And I'm sure some of the folks in the audience have seen, you know, the acronym for waters of the U.S. That, you know, some people have seen W-O-T-U-S or some have used the W-U-S, but it's all interchangeable. Uh, but basically, in a nutshell, um, you know, waters of the U.S. Waters of the U.S. are also considered um, jurisdictional. And just some examples of these are your territorial seas and your uh, traditional navigable waters, which are your, t your TNWs, and any tributaries that connect um, to these ter territorial seas and your navigable waters is also considered uh, jurisdictionals. Um, certain lakes, ponds, and impoundments are jurisdictional, and as I mentioned earlier, um, usually if it's man-made, um, they usually don't uh, fall under the jurisdiction of the core. Um, I've seen some instances where it, where it has, where, you know, maybe a landowner has um, dug a pond, but if you, and, and, and some of the things that we do in a, in a wetland report is we'll look at some of the historical imagery for that area to help us assess and delineate the area a little more accurately. But if the, um, historically, if there was a, you know, a small uh, pond or lake there that was not man-made and the farmer would go and dig that out to increase the size then of course that would fall under jurisdictional because it was already you know naturally made. So I've seen those type of uh, situations before. Okay. And then, no, sorry. Go ahead. And of course you have your you know your adjacent wetlands, and I mean we could go and probably spend a whole 30, 40 minutes of, of you know technical talk on you know what's considered adjacent. But in a general sense, anything that's adjacent to these 
jurisdictional waters is considered wetlands just because of their hydrological connection to these to these wetlands. Yeah, I would that's what I was about to ask. If you have a property and that has let's say a creek going through it, is that kind of automatically a wetland or is that water uh, what again the... no it's not. I mean um I can some and that that kind of gets in a gray area of the regulations, but basically, um, you know, some examples of some non-jurisdictional waters would be like an ephemeral stream. So when you're talking about a creek that flows year round, then absolutely. I mean, that's slam dunk, hands down, that's gonna be jurisdictional. Um anything intermittent with, with perennial pools will probably be considered um jurisdictional, but ephemeral has been thrown out. Uh, some other examples of uh, non-jurisdictional waters are like your roadside or farm ditches. Um, and like down here in Louisiana, there are tons of irrigation ditches that are dug in these in these uh, crop areas to you know to drain the water. And um, some of those can be jurisdictional because they do connect hydrologically and you know with surface water to some of these tributaries of navigable waterways. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, like, as I mentioned before, you man-made ponds generally don't fall into the jurisdictional um, realm of it. So you could have a creek in your property, but and then not have a wetland. Correct. Okay. Correct. Interesting. Correct. All right, permitting. I'm sure it's your favorite. Yeah. <laughs> if I could just say a word on the previous slide, that's yeah. kind of that. That slide is, gets it touches on a lot of complexity, and this is kind of where we're wading through the swamp because you know right. the questions you've asked lance really get into get to this like is this creek is it a jurisdictional water is it a there's a jurisdictional wetland you know is there possible to be a wetland that's not jurisdictional a man-made area and what follows in this navigable protection rule is a whole bunch of exceptions and things like ice, wetlands that are totally isolated that have no surface water connection are not regulated under the federal rules uh if something was uh created as a man-made creation for eights and somebody dug a gravel pit and they got done and they abandoned it and you come back 20 years later and it's become a wetland. Well, you can go back and look at the land use history and say, well, that was a mining facility. So it's not a jurisdictional wetland now, even though it has wetland characteristics. So this is, this becomes really complicated. So, you know, Brady alluded to, um, you know, we do a wetland report. We look at, land, you know, the history because that tells us a lot about you know, wh whether something would be a regulated water body or regulated wetland or not. Hmm. And and this is a case where Minnesota rules are different than the federal rules. So an ice, totally isolated wetland with no surface water connection is not regulated by the Corps of Engineers under federal rules, but it would be regulated by the state of Minnesota as well. Hmm. Yep. Okay, so for the wetland permits, um, kind of just to backtrack a little bit, Lance, you know, we, we talked about the, uh, you know, what, what makes a wetland a wetland, you know, with the characteristics. So, you know, obviously, you know, we go out in the field and we do a wetland, a temp, wetland delineation. Um, and then, you know, we, we gather those, that data, um, determine those characteristics. You know, we, uh, we go out and we map the wetlands and waters on the site. And then the, we compile a delineation report and uh, that is, generated and submitted to the Corps of Engineers for a jurisdictional determination or a JD. Uh, so basically that gives the Corps um, a chance to either agree with our findings or disagree with our findings. Um, and sometimes they will come out uh, to the site and do a follow-up visit to make sure all the boundaries are mapped accurately and whatnot. So that kind of gives us a segue into the wetland permit. So in order to get a wetland permit, you have to have a delineation done beforehand so that you actually know um, you know, where and how many wetlands you have on the site um, and based on the acreage. So now we're getting into the wetland permits. Uh, and again, this is, you know, something we could spend days on talking, but in general, uh, there's only, you know, in general, there's really just two types of permits that the core issues for any kind of wetland disturbance. Um, and that could be temporary or permanent. Um, and I think the two photos here from Daniel up in Minnesota, there's one, the top one is a uh, track hoe and a, in a uh, stream bed, it looks like he's clearing out some riprap or not. And the bottom one is um, some rutting um, in a wetland area. So those are temporary um, impacts um, to the wetland areas. And generally those are not um, considered part of the permit because they allow it to come back to the, the natural contours on the elevations um, when the project is over. So. But getting back into the permits, um, we have what's called a nationwide permit and uh, an individual permit. 
So Lance, if you want to jump to the next slide, yeah. we'll we'll get into those. Uh, so for a nationwide permit, this is the this is permits that any consultant loves to do. I mean, it's um, it's issued for activities with minimal impacts, and in a general sense, um, that impact threshold is no more than a half an acre. And I mean, it depends on the type of activity, type of project. I mean, there's 54 um, different nationwide permits that, that you could uh, apply for. So each one of those has its own threshold, um, you know, of, of impacts for that for that permit. And uh, as I mentioned, the streamlined permitting, um, This is these permits are usually Really quick to uh, compile and get through the system and, and uh, get to the get to the landowner or the project owner to get the things moving. Um, and some of the predefined activities, some of the examples are like minor dredging. Uh, there's a nationwide permit for residential developments, um, and then you know for your linear and transportation projects. So basically, I know down here in Louisiana and the New Orleans district. Um, you're looking at about four to six months um, from the time that you submit your delineation report, get your JD until you can actually receive your nationwide permit. The nationwide permits also allow for a certain amount of creativity that you can combine nationwide permits for an individual project. So for instance, if you had a project where you're building a solar photovoltaic generation plant, you could use a so nationwide permit for wetland impacts for the renewable energy for, for building pads for the solar panels. You could use another nationwide permit for util electrical utility lines, and you could use another nationwide permit for linear transportation for building access roads. As long as those all combine to less than a half acre of wetland loss, you can use a nationwide permit. So it's by defining, you know, 50 some categories, as Brady mentioned, the, the Corps of Engineers really allows for a lot of some flexibility for, for minor impacts. But, but earlier you said that the EPA is the governing body for wetlands, or did I miss? Yeah, I mean, it's the ultimate governing body. I mean, it, you know, but usually the, the only time that EPA will get involved in any kind of permit decision, if it's a ind individual permit scenario where, you know, it's a huge amount of acreage impacts, it's got a lot of public scrutiny, um, but most of the time is it's generally handled, you know, by the core and that's where it usually stops. Okay. Yeah, ultimately, you know, the Clean Water Act gives the authority to the EPA, but then they delegate some things. So, so there are some functions, some regulations under the Clean Water Act that the EPA delegates to individual states. And in the case of wetlands under Section 404 for dredge and fill permits, the EPA delegates that to the Corps of Engineers. Yep. Okay. So here is just kind of a table of a summary table of, of, of the differences with your nationwide versus your individual permit. And I mean, the individual permit can be, I mean, I've, I've had cases where it's taken two to three years to get it through the system um, just because of the amount of, of scrutiny that it has and the amount of review that it has to go through to get approved. So you can see, you know, why we we like to stay in a nationwide permit realm if we can, um, because it's a lot easier on us. Um, as consultants, because it's not that we don't want to do the work, it's just the scrutiny that's involved with getting an individual permit through is just, um, you know, it's, it's tough, and given the regulations right now. <laughs> and the main reason is because the size of the wetland? Well, your threshold between your nationwide permit and individual permit, you know, once you break that half acre threshold of impacts, it has um, to be individual. You know, it has to, it goes into an IP, which what you call an IP uh, situation. And then in the IP scenario, in, the, in that realm, I mean, there's different, you know, um, scenarios that they have to look at. I mean, it goes through the engineering review, it has to go through the the SHPO, I mean, it's it's a whole whole long list of um, litany of, of agency reviews just to just to get it to that step, and then you know you have to do an alternative needs analysis, which is a real pain in the butt sometimes if you get some of these wow. really really unique projects that you know you can't justify it, and then I mean in the core's eyes, if you can't justify your impact, then you're already on an uphill battle. So have you ever experienced like going through? Uh, 217 days of waiting for your permit. I mean, that's a long time to, to for your project to just stall and, and it actually gets denied. Have you ever had to do? Oh yeah, like yeah. That? I mean, and that that and with that and, and like I mentioned earlier, with some of these bigger projects that have a whole lot of public scrutiny and outcry, 
Um, in the individual permit, there's actually a public hearing on some of these permits where, you know, the public can come out and voice opposition to it. Um, you know, you have some of the, um, the environmental, you know, groups that come out and just, you know, they, they bring a lot of people. There's a lot of lobbying behind the scenes. So sure. What would be, one of the, what would, what would be one of the complaints? Like what would be one of the main concerns? I mean, um, I guess probably some of the biggest ones, I guess would be like a, a linear pipeline, uh, for uh -huh. instance, kind of the Keystone pipeline. I mean, um, uh -huh. it, it's, it's crossing, um, um, you know, Native American property, it's, it's, it's crossing, especially down here in some of the, um, the virgin swamp habitat down here. And I mean, there's a, you know, there's a misconception that, you know, these pipelines are going to, going to affect the environment, pollute it and whatnot. And, uh, you know, so you, you start getting that gotcha. kind of outcry and it's a, it's a tough job with consultant to, to, um, to process that. Sure. And plus, you know, it's hard to budget that kind of, that kind of, um, that project because you never know what you're getting into. Yeah, these, sure. these nationwide individual permits provide a really strong incentive for project proponents to try to figure out how to minimize their impacts. And that's you know the objective of the Clean Water Act is, is to protect the nation's waters, including wetlands. So they, so this you know threshold of half an acre is a really strong incentive. So if you're building a commercial development or housing development or a, a solar plant, you, there's a lot of flexibility in how you arrange it to minimize your impact so you can get under that half an acre. But there are some things like so the linear pipeline that Brady mentioned or a transmission line or a mine where you've, you know, your resource or what you're doing is going to cross multiple wetlands. You can't avoid that. So then you get into this higher level of scrutiny and you're going to get more scrutiny for, for uh, endangered species. And this project specific environmental review we mentioned on the table, it includes endangered species and also might include things like an environmental assessment or environmental impact statement. So that's why this processing time for an individual permit can be much longer in even you know even in a year or more in some cases because you've got to go through all this environmental impact statement you got to go to public notice you know there, there's public there's comments the, the agency the, and their consult and the consultants for the project owner have to respond to those comments so it's it, it becomes a big swamp <laughs> you yeah. have to wait through again <laughs> okay so we, i got a question from our audience um does the 217 days for uh ip include the public notice period yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this this report, this time I took from a Congressional Research Service document. And in 2016, that was the average day for an individual average length of time for an individual permit to be approved once it's submitted. So the 217 days is from when you submit it to the Corps of Engineers to when they issue a permit. And so that includes the public notice, that includes any project specific environmental review. Yeah, and I think the key the key term here is average. I mean, some of the you know, IP um situation go for three to four years so don't Ooh. you know i would tell i would tell everybody you know that's listening don't don't think it is 217 days is a magical number it's not it's an a average, hard yeah. set number that's an average of the processing time so um, yeah there, there, is, there is there is no regulated number that says the corps of engineers has to issue a decision by a certain amount of days they issue a number when they've done all the processing right. addressing all the issues they have to address and uh, another question for me is how do you get a permit without having to fill out an application how does that work you can't that that, well, that is is for... permit. sometimes you can <laughs> I, put in some, I put in sometimes because there are a few nationwide permits that allow you to do the work without submitting an application but that's for the very smallest impact so it's like less than a tenth of an acre so there's a few nationwide permits the conditions say that if you are impacting less than a tenth of an acre for permanent impacts and you meet all these conditions and there's multiple pages of conditions if you do meet all that you don't even have to submit an application you can just go do your work but you have to do it in, and abide by those conditions ah gotcha. but it's, it's a minor minority of cases where that happens most nationwide permits require you su to submit an application okay excellent all right moving on good discussion there all right now everybody's favorite birds and bunnies bald eagles and woodpeckers and bunnies and different uh, yeah, this, grass this becomes <laughs> yeah this becomes a can be a difficult thing that uh, really kind of trips up projects sometimes and it's the regulations coming out of the endangered species act that was passed in 1973 and a lot of individual states have their own state level endangered species act so when we do an endangered species review for a project we're looking at things that are listed by the federal government as threatened or endangered and also looking at things for the at the state 
And so this provides protection of species that are rare, endangered, at, at risk of going extinct, either from the whole country or you know, from the whole world or being, becoming extinct from an individual state. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why all of a sudden my, my you guys noticed that all of a sudden it'll jump. I'm not even touching it, and all of a sudden it jumps to the next slide. I'm like, that's weird. So, sorry about okay, that. Okay, so so that's fine. Um, <laughs> Fish and Wildlife Service regulates uh, a lot of the endangered species, mostly the you know the the inland things. National Marine Fisheries Service regulates um, impacts to threatened endangered species that are in marine environments. And then in, by individual state, it's going to vary by the by the agency. Often it's the Department of Natural Resources in an individual state that propagates and administers endangered species rules in the state. Okay, go on, Lance. Okay. So the Endangered Species Act prohibits the take of a protected species. And the take means any kind of harassment or killing or destru destruction of nests, things like that, that might harm a listed species. And it makes it illegal to harm or kill a species. And if there is a unavoidable conflict that you, it's gonna be necessary to impact, then you can get a take permit, and that's and that becomes a you know another swamp that you have to wade through. You have to you know establish that the species is there, and then what would be the impact from a proposed project, and then what can be done to minimize or to avoid or to mitigate impacts to that species. And you might already be talking about this next, but what's what's the what's the most unusual species that you've run into in your in your career? Either one of you. I mean, I'm sure did, you, you'll probably have some bald eagles up there, and yeah, we have, we have a lot of bald eagles in Minnesota. I, a long time ago, I did an oil spill response plan for a power plant in Florida, and mm -hmm. they had to assess all this. You know, this is separate from well, separate from wetlands, but it's it's a uh, you know something under the Oil Pollution Control Act, where they had to plan for what what would happen if they had a release. They had a a diesel storage tank right on the coast. And if, if they had the failure that and their secondary containment failed, then what would be, what could be harmed? And one of the things that could be harmed would be manatees. I was manatees say, would come up. Yep. Yeah, they would come, it was in Florida and they could come up to the warm water discharge at the power plant and in the winter, especially to mm -hmm. seek out that warm water. So that was one of the concerns we had to address. Yeah. And I know down here, Lance, I mean, uh, for all the deer hunters down here in Louisiana, we um, actually have a very large black bear population, uh, believe it or not. Um, wow. And it's very frustrating to sit in your deer stand and watch a, a, a big bear come under your feeder and just sit there and spin the spin plate and eat all the corn out of it. Um, and, you know, you really can't do You can't do <laughs> yeah, anything about it. What are you going to do about it? it? Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? So. You have to sit there. But, you know. That um, the red cockaded woodpeckers are a big thing here, especially in North Louisiana, um, and then the gopher tortoises um, and the sandy soils here are a big thing down here. So we have to look out for all of that. And I remember from previous um, previous uh, webinars that we've done on this, it's not everybody always thinks of the bald eagle or the manatee or something that you know th these high visible, but uh, most of the time it's it's something that you've never even heard of, like you know something something beetle and or some, it's a, some cricket or it, it always seems that that's the case. Is that what you guys yeah, find I, most of the time or? Yeah, that, yeah, I think that's true. That it's, it's kind of the exception that you get some, some charismatic, um, you know, animal that, that's an issue. It's, it's oftentimes it's, you know, some frog or something or, or being a botanist myself, then I'm dealing with plants. And, and so there's some, you know, things where it might be such and such milkweed, means milkweed in the Midwest. And people say, well, it's a weed. It says right there in the name, it's a milkweed. It's a weed. Why are we worrying about it? <laughs> it's true. All right. So I, we do have another uh, question um, from our audience. Um, he makes a statement that he's not an expert in this area, but he understands it's also about destroying habitat, not just harming the species. Is that correct? Is that a potential take to be measured also? It, yeah, it, it, it varies. So having um, unoccupied habitat typically is not a take, but then, you know, if you have habitat and the organism is living in there, then altering that habitat could be a take. And there's also a concept in endangered species law called critical habitat. And that is a defined area, geographic area that the Fish and Wildlife or National Marine Fisheries Service defines as 
essential for the survival of that species and they will draw a boundary on a map and say this is critical habitat for whatever species and then that could be a regulated take if you're going to affect that critical habitat and it's important to realize that critical habitat is a regulatory definition for a geographic area it's not the general more generalized ecological habitat like you know gen general habitat means you know the type of environmental conditions where an organism lives critical habitat is a very specific regulatory definition so it's a little bit separate from from that. So when we do an endangered species valuation, we look at is it is the endangered species there? Is is there habitat? Is there critical habitat? So all you know different things to to consider. But yet in some cases, an effect to habitat could be a take that's regulated. Interesting. Good question. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Ah. Ready for the next one. So yeah. this is in general, in general how we do a, an endangered species review. We look at databases, we query databases based on geography. So somebody might come to us with a project, they want to you know, build a wind farm in a given area. So we look at databases to see what, what is known for the endangered species for that area, for that state, for that county, what endangered species are known to be of concern there do a desktop review, what kind of habitats do those species use, what kind of habitats are present on this site, and is there a potential for those species to occur? And if there is a potential for species to occur, we do additional evaluation. Is there gonna be an impact? What can be done to design the project to avoid an impact? And in some cases, it, it requires additional work for field studies to, to determine to get data in the from the field as to you know what the presence of the species or the condition of the habitat and then assess impacts and go on with take permitting a couple examples i just want to present the, where we have dealt with endangered species reviews at braun intertech uh, brady mentioned the red cockaded woodpecker and we've done a few reviews for where the red cockaded woodpecker came up as a potential um, species that would, might be present and there was one in in Texas area near Houston where we did an evaluation and we did the desktop review and everything came back and said well you know there's probably you know the right pine trees there and the, the bird might be there and so we looked at a little bit further into guidelines from Fish and Wildlife Service and they developed pretty specific description of habitat and so we were able to do a field study to look at the types of trees the density of trees uh, the type of ground cover and we we're able to determine that that particular site we were looking at was not habitat for the, for a red cockaded woodpecker so in this case we did not even have to go to the step of of getting an ornithologist to go out there and do bird studies we could tell just from the habitat that it's not suitable for the red cockaded woodpecker and another example this one from minnesota we had a, a project that was doing some work some excavation in in a river and a reservoir below the water line and there was concern for endangered species for their aquatic endangered species in this case mussels and these are state listed species and so we did the the desktop review and you know everything came out that everything came out that this this could be they could be present this is a concern that the excavation in the water could affect these and so we hired a subcontractor to go out to the site and scuba dive for these mussels and they found over a thousand mussels in the project area and about a hundred of them were a state listed endangered species so this is a case where we had to carry it all the way from the beginning to the end of doing the desktop review and then doing a field study. And in this case, we did not have to do an impact. We did not have, we did not have an impact and we did not have to do a take permit application. The DNR agreed to that when we do the survey, we could just have the contractor relocate the mussels. And so this is a way they could totally avoid any impact to the mussels from this project. Wow. Um because I'm sure if he found a thousand, there was probably more than that. You probably they try to be you know as thorough as they can, but you yeah. know there's only you, there's you know limit to how well you can do when you're working so, in the water. So you can so not only you can look at if there is a uh, woodpecker in that woods, you don't even need to see it, but you looking at if it is actually um, potentially habitat. It could have so you're not even. So you're saying it could potentially home this red cockaded woodpecker or? Yeah, so, so when we do these reviews, we're really looking for reasons we can rule out a species being present. So we might get a you know database review and we might have 20 species that could potentially be in this area. So, you know, we look at sort of, uh, you know, course things first, like, you know, th there 
might be a you know, some of the species listed might be aquatic well our project site is not aquatic so we can immediately rule out there's not going to be an impact to aquatic species from this so then we you know just go further down can we exclude the species for whatever reason and so in the case of the red carcated woodpecker if we would have come back and said well this habitat is appropriate we would have had to either assume it's present and get a take permit or hire an ornithologist to go out and do a survey to determine if it really is there or not so I have another um, question from our audience. We have a very active audience, so thank you very much. That's I love great. it. Uh, so uh, when a wetland, when wetlands determination is done for an area, is an endangered species assessment done at the same time? If not, how does a consultant know when and if it's and if you proceed with this assessment? That's a good question. We, I, Daniel, I don't know. How you guys do it up there, but I know down here. I mean, we we offer that service um, as an as an add-in uh, since we're already out in the field doing the delineation. We we add that in, um, especially if some of these um, bigger projects um, are expected to have a permit um, application with it. The core will require um, a threatened and endangered species survey anyway. So we just add as a as a as a you know add-in for for you know to do during our wetland delineation so it really depends on the project it depends on the client um i know i've had several um small private clients that you know they don't they don't really care about threatened daisy species whatever and they don't really have the money to do it so you know sometimes it's a budgetary issue so you know it can be it depends on the project and client so let me ask you this and you may not want to answer this, by the way, but let's say you're out there doing a wetlands and you ask, hey, do you guys want to do endangered species? And they say no. You're out there doing your wetland and then you find um, a red cockaded woodpecker out there. And I'm just I'm just saying that. Are you obligated to, to report it or how does that work? Um, I don't think we're obligated to report it, um, but at the same time, you know, I'm not going to not mention it, um, you know, because I like to tell my clients I'm brutally honest with my opinions, you know, when they hire me, um, because, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm going to tell them this is what you're looking at. So, I mean, if something's there, then I'm going to make it known and then give them the option to proceed or, you know, put a, put a game plan together. Gotcha. Another question from our audience. Have you ever had a desktop review field study indicate an endangered species should not be there, but then it's found while completing the project? I can't think of a time where that's happened. I try to be really conservative when I do a desktop review and and assume that it's there and I have to see evidence to prove to me that it's not there. So I can't think of a time where I found, you know, there's pretty, there's pretty, I think, you know, a lot of species will have strong affinity for their habitat. And so, you know, if we go to a site that's, um, you know, in Texas, where it's might be open and grassy, we're not going to find red codcated woodpecker. Or if you do, it's just flying between one forest to another. It's not, it's not its habitat where it lives. Mm -hmm. So it's usually, I can't think of a time where I've had a surprise where, where I found an endangered species that wasn't expected. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, I haven't either. All right. They're not like people. They don't roam as widely as people. I mean, you, you know, people go everywhere, but endangered species don't so much. <laughs> <laughs> good discussion good discussion they they yeah okay <laughs> we're going to talk about the national environmental policy act and this is this is abbreviated as nepa and this is an environmental review process that applies to federal actions and i put these little graphic these clip art on the side to refer to tell us what kind of um federal actions might be involved and it can be a permit from the federal government that triggers a nepa review and so you know, referring back to what Brady was talking about, the individual permits, that if you have an individual wetland permit, that could trigger NEPA that requires a more in-depth environmental review. So if you have an individual permit, you're probably going to go through a federal um, environmental assessment. And if other, other types of, of involvement of federal actions are when something is, is has federal funding, and we work with quite a few clients that are on housing developments, multifamily housing developments, and they get funding from HUD to help support that that development, well, HUD requires an EPA review. It's going back to the National Environmental Policy Act that's requiring them to do that. And then another time is there's a federal action is when something is happening on federal land, like somebody might build, be building some infrastructure, a pipeline or a transmission line, and they cross federal land. Then to get a 
conditional use permit or whatever approval they get from the federal agency that administers that land, they probably have to go through a NEPA review and that might involve an environmental assessment or environmental impact statement. And this is an evaluation of potential impacts before a project is approved and it, reflect, it pertains to natural resources and also human impacts like is the, does this project create health hazards that would affect people and it can also include socioeconomic factors like is it you know is there going to be a new build, big new infrastructure that might create new demand on the area schools or something like that for you know a very large project like you know building a new um a new federal research facility, something like that. Um, so, it, but it's it really depends a lot on the type of project and who's the regulatory agency as to what the nature of that environmental review will be, will take. And the next slide takes talks on that a little bit more. Uh, so there are different levels of review under NEPA. There is an exemption, and those are usually things that are purely administrative, like you know, federal agency doing its payroll or, or minor landscaping, something like that. A categorical exclusion. This is kind of analogous to a nationwide permit for wetlands. And this is for minor projects that fit predefined categories. An environmental assessment, which is a relatively simple document to determine if there will be significant effects. And it's not a document to ascertain what those impacts will be. It's just an, a document that goes into enough detail to determine is there potential for significant impacts? And if there is potential for significant impacts, then the next step is environmental impact statement. And this is a comprehensive detailed document that really get, takes a deep dive into potential impacts to natural resources, to human resources, to socioeconomic considerations, and how the project could be modified to mitigate negative impacts. Each federal agency or department develops their own NEPA procedures. And so there are over a hundred different sets of rules for how you do a NEPA review. So if you have a project that's a transmission line through a national forest, you go Department of Agriculture or Forest Service and you look at their NEPA procedures. If you have a, an affordable housing project, you go look at HUD NEPA procedures. If you have a wetland project that's an individual permit, you go look at the Corps of Engineers NEPA procedures. And they all go back to the National Environmental Policy Act, which defines sort of the general procedure, but the specific way that's accomplished depends on which federal agency has jurisdiction over the action that's that the federal action in question. Well, wow. that's that's a lot of set of rules. There's there's a, there's a lot there. I just <laughs> I just yeah. said. So I'd be be happy to see here if people have questions on that because that is just a that is just a big ball of wax that just you know can really become a complicated thing this is another reason where there's incentive to um, plan your projects carefully you know get a nationwide permit or fit the category or fit the definition of a category of exclusion because you avoid the larger larger impact from from larger projects so here's an example of i want to mention where we did an environmental assessment for a project called fort snelling upper post and this is one that was de defined by state rules so everything we've talked about today we're mostly talking about federal rules but depending on state by state variation there can be state level rules for wetlands and endangered species i mentioned and then also for environmental review so minnesota has an environmental review state specific and we did bond intertech perform environmental assessment for redevelopment of fort snelling upper post and there's dozens of abandoned buildings that used to be part of an army post that were used for training world war ii world war one era that the buildings date back to late 19th century, early 20th centuries, and they've been abandoned for decades and they're being redeveloped for affordable housing. And so we completed an environmental assessment on behalf of our client. And several of the issues that were the biggest issues that we dealt with were one, these are historic buildings. They're net listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The buildings are owned by the state of Minnesota and they're located within a state park. There were concerns about endangered species, specifically bats, in this case, a federally endangered bat and then some state listed bats that might occur either in the trees or the buildings. There's concerns about hazardous materials like lead based paint in these buildings that uh, might create a human exposure while while they're being renovated or they in order to be habitable habitable. I can't say that word in order to be become habitable. These buildings <laughs> would have to have that lead based paint removed. And then this facility is also adjacent to the Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport. So then noise was a concern and does that create a, a negative a potential negative effect for human health so 
an environmental assessment or environmental impact statement can be pretty wide ranging and cover a whole host of different topics. And it's, again, it's kind of project specific or agency specific how, how it's dealt with. So, so what happened? What happened was all these things were all these things where there were issues were de de either the developer or we worked with the developer to come up with mitigation um, procedures for how they can address these concerns. So for historic buildings, they have to be really careful about how they um, renovate them and try to preserve as much of the building as possible. They have to um, be careful about when they're going to cut trees that might have it, have bats in them. And if they're going to cut during the active season, then they were going to have to have a biologist on site to look at the trees before they cut them. Um, hazardous materials, they have to remove the lead from the buildings, the adjacency to the airport and noise. The buildings are going to have um, really good noise mitigation in the walls and the windows so that when you're inside the, the housing units, there really won't be a noise impact from the nearby airport. So there was a determination made that there will not be a significant impact from development of the site because they developed mitigation measures and wrote and we wrote that into the environmental assessment. It looks like a cool place to live. I'm sure once they get it all. The, these buildings up. are so cool. You know, these yeah. historic buildings, they're just so cool. They're so interesting. So we returned back to our original picture, wading through the swamp. So we've, you know, been talking about, you know, several things related to wetlands, environmental review, endangered species. So how we help our clients wade through the swamp, you know, in three bullet points, we identify affected resources, we identify project reviews, permits, approvals that are needed. And then something we haven't talked about, but I wanted to bring it up at the end is this affects a project timeline and budget. And so, you know, somebody that's planning a housing development or a wind farm, you've got to be cognizant that these environmental considerations can affect their, their project and budget. And we try to help, help our clients understand what those constraints are. And Brady will be brutally honest, like he said, and tell them, it won't sugarcoat it, it'll tell them, you know, what's, what's needed, where, where the problems are, might, might occur. Brady, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, especially down here in the New Orleans district. Um, as of June of last year, they really um, instituted a more rigorous um, outline of, of, of what they're acquiring as far as, uh, you know, what you've got to do in the field for delineation. And um, it, it, it really, I mean, it almost doubles and almost triples the, uh, the, the effort now because of the, the added um, man hours in the field for what they're what they're required, and then also they're requiring additional information and supporting documents in the wetland report. So I've had several clients, you know, that that has followed me around for years, and uh, you know they they they're getting sticker shock now because of the the new requirements for, you know, the delineation report and the and the field portion of it too. So, you know that that comes in again, you know, being brutally honest, and um, you know sometimes they'll go to someone else that can do it cheaper, uh, but the reason why the core has um, put these new requirements out is trying to streamline the um, how these reports look. So it's kind of like a boilerplate uh, report and it takes a lot of the mom and pop um, firms out because historically they would just give them basic information and the core had to do a lot of their own legwork um, compared to what it is now. So it's actually sped up the, the review process and, and, and the process and time that it takes to get the permit. So I'm not really complaining about it, but I um, just want to throw it out there that, you know, they are, they are getting worse with the regulations and, um, you know, we just got to take that in consideration on the time and budget of pro projects. So we make sure to tell that up front to our clients. Okay, so this has been my favorite audience ever. So I have more questions from them. So if you guys are ready, uh, we're, we are running out of time, so if anybody needs to get off, we totally understand, but we'll stay on to answer as many questions as we can. But what about animals with large home ranges? For instance, a gopher tortoise habitat adjacent to a potential project area. Does the species home range come into question? Um, I know for down here, uh, those gopher tortoises are really common in the, in the Florida parishes and some of the areas where it's a really you know good sandy soil. Uh, but usually when um, there's a known population um, of those tortoises in the area, 
um, the wildlife and fish, the State Department of Wildlife and Fisheries here will require you to go out and do a, um, a gopher tartar survey where you're actually counting burrows, you're counting live individuals, you know, in some, some instances, dead individuals. Um, and they don't really put a whole lot of scrutiny and focus on the home range because it's, the gopher tortoise is really, a, you know, an, I say an easy uh, species to find because, I mean, they have a very, very um, preferable and strict kind of habitat. So home range in this case really doesn't play into that, into that factor very much. So many of these, the regulations or the way they're implemented for endangered species really vary by individual, by species, you know, ranging from species to species because it's going to, you know, what, you know, works for gopher tortoise isn't going to work for red cockaded woodpecker, isn't going to work for Canada lynx. So, you know, if you have an impact to species or, or habitat, you know, you work with a consultant, work with the Fish and Wildlife Service, work with the DNR to figure out what what kind of impact is allowed or how do you avoid impacts or whatever. Because you say you have an occupied, you have a property and you have an occupied habitat with red cockaded woodpecker or something like that. You might be able to remove some of those trees and you're not going to directly kill a woodpecker. But, you know, at some point that population living there becomes so small that it's not self-sustaining. So then it will, you know, go extinct on that site or in that area. So this is, that becomes a consideration, like how you assess if there is a take, if you're taking part of the habitat and not the individuals. So it's, it's really, like I said, it's individually um, species specific as to how you would make that determination. Okay, excellent. Okay, next question. The past administration changed NEPA rules. Is the current administration bringing back previous rules? I have not seen anything published where they're going to go back to previous rules. They, what I have seen to come out from the new administration is they're going to ask for climate change to be considered under NEPA. There's, there's a couple of things that the previous administration did. One was they removed climate change from NEPA and then they did a, a larger revision of NEPA rules. And I haven't seen anything yet about the larger revision of NEPA rules, but I expect that will come. A couple of the, the priorities from the new administration that we know about now are climate change, and that will be things like assessing carbon um, greenhouse gas emissions from a proposed project, and also considering under NEPA the, how a project is adapted or resilient to climate change. And then the second thing that's a priority under the new administration is greater consideration of environmental justice. And this refers to consideration of maybe disadvantaged communities and how they might be disproportionately affected by a proposed project. So that's what I got for that. I, but I'm expecting maybe there will be some more um, modifications to NEPA rules in the coming years. Sure. Okay, there's there's a lot more questions. I don't think we're going to get to them, but I'm going to make sure that everybody, I'm going to make sure that uh, Daniel and, and Brady get the, your questions and they'll email you back with a question. But uh, last question um, is private pipelines ever have to do a whole of NEPA or just wetland endangered species law compliance, etc. If I need to repeat that question, or do you, did you understand the question? Yeah, it's it's going to vary because we, we have to look at what is the federal action that would trigger NEPA. So it could be wetlands or it could be an impact of endangered species or a lot of times a, where there's a trigger for NEPA for a pipeline is crossing federal land. And so because, you know, when there's when you're on federal land then that's going to trigger, you know, some, whatever federal agency administers that land for their approval. So it really varies. There is no single pipeline trigger for for under NEPA. It's going to depend on you know each sort of individually what federal ag federal agency might be involved. Okay, so um, I'm going to send you to I'm going to send you the other questions uh, so you have a little bit more time to answer them. Um, I did get a question about uh, completion certificates, and yes, we are able to send you guys completion certificates um, and. Um, I will try to uh, get those to you, or as we have to actually talk about exactly how we're going to do them, but we will make sure that we get you something um, if you need that. So I want to get everybody, uh, oh, I want to get, here's uh, Daniel and Brady's uh, contact information. If you have any specific questions you want to ask or call and, um, or email them, and I'm sure they'd be happy to help you with your project.
but thank you guys so much for uh, for joining us uh, on this webinar. I know it takes a lot of work to put these webinars, but you guys did a fantastic job. That hour flew by. So thank you guys so much for, for doing this for us. No problem. We look and, forward to doing another one in the future and answering these questions. Yeah. yeah happy, happy. Go ahead, Daniel. Go ahead. Happy, happy to do it, and I appreciate the uh, the great interest from the audience and the, the involvement in the questions. I, I really feel like we're we're maybe maybe I can be a doctor and help people. <laughs> when I get questions. The doctor is in, yeah. <laughs> but uh, now I didn't to let everybody know, but uh, Daniel is actually on vacation, and so he joined us. Uh, where are you, by the way? I'm in Daytona Beach, Florida. Oh, no, okay. Well, nice. Well, being in Texas when we had all our freeze, um kind of jealous about that so but thank you guys for joining us on our webinar um, we can't wait to see you the next time uh, our next webinar is building storage tanks what you need to know about testing and inspections and that's going to be on march 25th and you can go to our braun intertech website and uh, register for that so thank you all for joining us and have a great afternoon thanks lance all right thank you bye guys <laughs>